So it's now my pleasure to introduce the chair for today's first keynote presentation. And this is on harnessing research for better health, a vision for integrating research into healthcare. This is a flagship policy project for the Academy. And this is led by Professor Chris Mitchell. Chris is a physician scientist who is, and has been for some time, the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences at Monash University. She and a group have made contributions to the field of intracellular signaling and hematology. And the work that they have done has concentrated on the regulation of phosphoinositide signaling by the inositol polyphosphate 5 phosphatases. And her group is characterizing the pathways that regulate phosphoinositide signaling in human cancer. And the group was among the first groups to purify and to clone the phosphatases involved and to delineate the substrates for these enzymes that are critical in cancer. As well, Chris has taught the molecular basis of human diseases and hematology to science students, to biomedical students, to medical students at Monash University. And Chris has played a major role in research leadership, building research teams and building infrastructure. Chris, it is my very great pleasure now to hand over to you. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce the keynote address uh, by Professor Sir John Saville. I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. I'm meeting on the Kulin lands of the Kulin nations and the, I pay my respect to the elders past and present. So it's a great pleasure to introduce this keynote address embedding research and healthcare in two nations divided by a common language that will be delivered today by Professor Sir John Saville. Now, it would probably take me the entire keynote address to actually list all of John's contributions and outstanding achievements, but currently he's Executive Director of the Melbourne Academic Centre for Health since July 2019. He graduated in Physiological Sciences from Oxford, Oxford and then in Medicine from the University of Sheffield. He has an extremely distinguished career with spells as first as the Director of University of Edinburgh Medical Research Council Centre for Information Research, the first Vice Principal and Head of College of Medicine and Veterinary Medicine, Chief Scientist for the Scottish Government Health Directories, and Chief Executive and Deputy Chair of the Medical Research Council. He was knighted in the 2008 UK New Year's Honours List for services to clinical medicine. Uh, thank you, John, so much for delivering this keynote address, and I look forward with great interest your talk thank you thanks chris before i you go can you just reassure me you can hear me yes great okay well um i'm very very pleased to be invited to speak in this meeting and i'm even more pleased to have been elected yesterday as a fellow of the academy uh, so thank you on both counts and thank you Christina for acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we share here in Melbourne. Now, eight years ago Winston Churchill quipped that Britain and America were two countries divided by a common language uh, and he might have said the same about Australia. So here in Altona in Melbourne uh, if I hear the word football, I still think about a game played by 11 players with a round ball on a rectangular football pitch. But my neighbour thinks about a game played by 18 players um, with a ball that looks like a rugby ball uh, on a cricket ground. Uh, uh, and you can score without hitting the target. So football means completely different things to completely different people. And I think there are some words that we use in Britain and Australia that mean different things and I'll explain uh, towards the end of this presentation. Now if we can go to the next slide, uh, the first question I'd like to ask is why embed research in healthcare? Well in fact this year's Clutch of Fellows is a really good example of one of the three reasons I've chosen to highlight. And that is increasingly now we understand more and more about biology and pathology by studying humans. So Jerry Adams, Suzanne Corey and David Huang all um, were elected as fellows this year for fantastic work. If you like, was bedside to bench. It started 
with delineation of the BCL2 protein in follicular lymphoma. Uh, this was shown to be overexpressed because of a T1418 translocation, and the rest is history. Um, this protein that's a break on cell death is now a target for a very effective new class of drugs led by venetoclax that has transformed the outlook for patients with lymphoma and leukemia. And indeed, I think about Sidney Brenner, the, the brilliant physician and scientist and Nobel Prize winner in 2000, who said that the experimental animal of the 21st century is man, by which he meant that human biology was going to lead the understanding of biology. Now, conversely, the second reason to do this is takes a completely different tack, and that is that research embedded in healthcare is much better placed to meet healthcare's needs. Uh, and I think this is a very important concept. Uh, and what I'm gonna talk about really is the, the third area, which is translation of research for health and wealth, uh, which if you like, brings these two ends of the picture together. So if we go to the next slide, um, my credentials to worry about this are long. I've been worrying about clinical research in the UK since at least 2002. And I won't bore you with the details of this slide, but something I didn't realize until I put it together was that the budget I looked after in the NHS R&D system in Scotland, 23 Aussie dollars per person per year, was identical to the apparently much bigger budget that I looked after at the chief executive, uh, as chief executive of the Medical Research Council which again was $23 per person per year. And if we go on to the next slide, here's a comparison between uh, the two governments with direct government funding of health research in the UK, totaling about $54 per person per year. Uh, and once the MRF, F, pardon me, there's an F missing there, gets up to its full expenditure, there's perhaps gonna be a little bit more money uh, directly hypothecated for health research per person per year in Australia. But this theme of two nations divided by a common language, uh, if we can move to the next slide, is underlined by the fact that we, um, on the next slide, uh, that the money is spent differently in the two countries. So of that directly hypothecated government funding, you can see a high proportion is spent in the health service on R&D support, $20 per citizen per year. Uh, whereas in Australia, I currently have no idea what the split is, as I'll explain. But I think that the figure directly embedded in healthcare is probably far less than $5 per person per year. So let's press on to the next slide. Now, on the face of it, the UK has a tremendous advantage over Australia in terms of medical research funding, because we're blessed with these massive um, research charities. By the way, the MRC isn't 14 billion, it's 1.4 billion, sorry about that. Uh, so you can see that, that really the, the hypothecated funding from NIHR and MRC is more or less matched by funding from charities. And this is a very important feature of our ecosystem in the UK, uh, which serves 65 million people. But on the next slide, um, what I've got is data I access from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare site, um, which says that, um, uh, again, I didn't spot this typo, uh, <laughs> that about 5 billion Aussie dollars per year is spent on health research uh, in Australia, not 85, would that it were. Uh, and this equates to $192 per person per year, which uh, is of course rather more than we've got in the UK. But when you pour over the website and try and find where that money is, you don't get a very satisfying answer. You can probably only find about 2.8 billion of the five. There's the NHMRC budget, there's the MRFF budget where it will get to states and territories. I put a question mark next to 
because uh, at least in the year shown on the website, 830 million was spent. But knowing what's normally spent in Victoria, I think a lot of that has been on capital projects. CSIRO spends some of its money directly on healthcare, and there are other sources of healthcare research funding, as you can see, but they aren't quantitated on that website. So what I want to talk about on the next slide uh, uh, is translation. And this is my personal definition of translation. It's the movement of health and medical research from the, the laboratory and the library to secure impact in the clinic, the community and the company. And what I'm going to do on the next slide, in fact, we might as well push on to the slide after, please, let's do that, is run you through how the UK over the last 15 years has organised the pathway, the people, the plant and the partnerships to promote translation. So the pathway, if we go to the next slide, was set out in a very influential report written by Sir David Cooksey in 2005, which had the bland title of a, a review of UK health research, but which was quickly uh, um, nicknamed Lost in Translation. And all the audience will have seen diagrams like this. This is David's diagram uh, showing uh, a probably artificial left to right basic discovery to healthcare delivery um, a continuum with two key gaps in translation. The first gap from the, the laboratory into clinical development and the second gap from clinical development into uh, um, clinical implementation and healthcare. Uh, and I think simply getting this out there and getting this understood in Britain was enormously influential because people realised that he was right that there were these big gaps that needed addressing. So let's go to the next slide. Now clearly um, we need the people to do translation. Uh, and on the next uh, slide, uh, we heard earlier that Chris is chairing what I think is the first major report of the Australian Academy. This was the first major report of the British Academy of Medical Sciences, which I was asked to chair uh, and it addressed this issue of uh, training clinician scientists, clinician researchers, whatever you want to call them. Uh, uh, this was published in 2000 and it took six years, uh, lots of effort uh, and some uh, serendipity with a new training system coming in for junior doctors for us to reach the situation on the next slide, um, which was a pathway recommended by Mark Walport at that time, um, uh, director of the Wellcome Trust and chaired a committee that I and others I'll tell you about served on. Uh, and this implemented the findings of our report with a brilliant integrated academic training pathway, which enables research minded doctors to train to the very highest standards of clinical medicine, uh, whilst integrating that with research training that will eventually lead to them be becoming um, uh, independent researchers. Now on the next slide, this, this is coming to Australia. So Stuart Carney, uh, now Deputy Dean in Brisbane, um, was the junior doctor representative on that Walpole committee back in 2006. And he's actually chaired a group for the group of eight uh, that made proposals to the chief medical officer uh, in the area of workforce. And this is the proposed track for hospital specialists interested in uh, research uh, in uh, Australia. Uh, and unsurprisingly, it's very similar to the tried and tested British track. Now, this probably needs quite a deal of investment, but on the next slide, what I want to show you is what we've been doing in Melbourne over the last couple of years, which is using our own resources within the organisation I serve, the 19 partner Melbourne Academic Centre for Health. We've been able to put together a kind of form fruist of Stuart Carney's track, which integrates research training, pre-PhD, PhD and post-PhD with the completion 
of vocational training, not just for hospital specialists, but also GPs and public health doctors. Uh, so uh, I, I am optimistic that there are the pathways now developing in Australia to develop the clinician researchers and translators that we need to achieve, achieve translation. And just to reassure you that these sorts of things have impact on the next slide, uh, here is the uh, NIHR graph from the start of these programs uh, in 2006. And you can see that there was a quadrupling of the number of properly trained uh, young doctors uh, going through this kind of system. So let's press on to the next slide, which is kind of about people and plant, because one of the most salient changes that occurred in Britain around 2006 was this, if we go on to the next slide, it was the establishment um, of the National Institute for Health Research in uh, England, uh, with similar organisations already in place in the rest of the UK, and a real focus on investing in the people needed to serve as infrastructure for clinical research. So if we go to the next slide, we can see here, uh, this is England, so with Scotland at the top missing and Wales at the left missing and Northern Ireland missing as well. Um, 15,000 skilled resort research staff clock on every day now expecting to spend much of their time uh, helping deliver clinical research across that, the nation. And this costs the nation um, roughly 10 Aussie dollars per citizen per year. It's a very substantial investment, but it's absolutely transformed clinical research. Uh, and the next slide is probably an unfairly selected graph from me, because in fact, the trend upwards continues uh, beyond 2015-16. There's been a complete revolution uh, in recruitment of participants into commercial studies. Uh, uh, and for every uh, participant in the British NHS uh, that's in a commercial study, the NHS benefits by about 28,000 Aussie dollars per year. So this is very significant benefit to the system. Uh, uh, and moving on to the next slide, six Aussie dollars per year is invested in NIHR biomedical research translation centres. Uh, uh, and these address the first gap in the um, uh, uh, pathway that uh, David Cooksey identified. So let's press on to the next slide and talk a bit about key plant, which is something that I think Australia really could uh, develop to its advantage. Uh, uh, and if we go to the next slide, uh, here's a new instrument for health research. Now I did, I finished my PhD in 1989 much of it actually uh, involved the uh, uh, device on the left, first discovered in the 17th century and really applied brilliantly to medicine in the 19th century. Uh, but of course, the 21st century, we're now thinking about digital health um, on the right. And I got turned on to this, um, uh, if we can go to the next slide, while serving as grandiosely titled chief scientist in Scotland's health directorates, when I discovered that embedded within the NHS in Scotland was this remarkable uh, secure clinical innovation diabetes system, which had been developed from research, had now become an integral part of clinical care, and every night captured all the data available uh, on every diabetic in Scotland. So it had uh, uh, nearly 200,000 retinal photographs, it had blood tests, it had uh, prescription data and so on and so on. And simply collecting the data on the next slide, this is a rather old slide, but this was soon after they started doing this in Dundee, Tayside, there was a 40% reduction in complications such as amputations and blindness, because clinicians of course were able to see the, the longitudinal data for their patients and compare patient with patient very easily. Now this, this system has had enormous benefits in, for research as well. So if we go to the next slide, 
One of the world's first studies that showed that statins prevented uh, cardiovascular disease was done in Glasgow, the west of Scotland, coronary prevention study, WASCOPS. And below that um, icon is Ian Ford, who uh, remains the biostatistician who's been most closely associated with the WASCOPS study. And what Ian did um, uh, fairly recently, if we go to the next slide, um, was use the Scottish clinical information system, unique identifier with every, for every patient, 99.8% of all interactions are captured. Um, uh, and he was able to track the patients who'd been in the active group and those in the placebo group. Uh, uh, and you don't need to be told that the red line um, uh, with the uh, cardiovascular events is actually those who didn't have pravastatin during the study. So there's long-term benefit. The original study cost $30 million. This study, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, cost $30,000. And indeed, uh, in Scotland now, most clinical trials are done in the same way on this kind of real-world basis of comparing patients with the intervention with carefully matched patients without the uh, intervention, uh, an approach that some people call registry trials. Uh, so very, very beneficial for research. Uh, and indeed, when I went to the MRC, next slide, I spent nearly all my seven years there working with nine other funders because the MRC didn't have enough money um, to build Health Data Research UK, which is a UK wide institute for data, health data research. And on the next couple of slides, we can just see some impact from doing this. So this is a large and very complicated cardiovascular trial, um, which involved testing for feasibility 1.5 million people in 90 hospitals to see who met the entry criteria. Uh, and really that sort of thing can only be done electronically. And the benefit of setting this up, this is the Digi DigiTrials Hub, the HDR UK funds, was um, blindingly obvious in the first few months of the COVID pandemic as it affected Britain. Because if we see on the next slide, um, the now very famous recovery trial, which, include, which uh, uh, recruited 10,000 patients with COVID, um, severe COVID, uh, in less than two months uh, and generated the first evidence that dexamethasone was effective, um, uh, was, was done so efficiently and so quickly because the DigiTrials Hub was able to find the patients and uh, ensure that they were invited to join the study. So on the next slide, the last thing I wanted to talk about was partnerships. Um, and I'm hoping not to get any death threats as a consequence of this bit. Uh, uh, and partnerships are all about collaboration on the next slide. And of course, everyone in the room will have enjoyed collaborating with like-minded investigators. And indeed, I think increasingly, we all see the value of, recruit, of collaboration between disciplines. So on the next slide, here's a very influential report written by the Regis Professor of Medicine, uh, in, Ca in Cambridge, Patrick Maxwell, who confusingly, because of medieval terminology, is called the Regis Professor of Physic, no S, Physic meaning medicine, uh, for the Engineering and Physical research, Sciences Research Council, which really laid out a, a brilliant set of arguments for why engineering and physical sciences are important to health and life sciences. And this came home to me on the next slide in 2013, when, um, if we have the next slide. In 2013, when as MRC chief executive, I had to uh, look after the queen when she opened the new MRC laboratory of molecular biology at Cambridge. Now the queen had form in that she'd done this before with the original building in 1962 on the left, when things were a bit more formal and people wore gowns. And what stuck in my mind in 2013 was she met four PhD students 
uh, and these four PhD students were a mathematician, a physicist, a chemist, and a computer scientist, all doing PhDs uh, in a medical research institute and illustrating the importance, if you like, of interdisciplinary research. Um, but the next slide highlights, I think, what's been most difficult in Britain and maybe difficult in Australia, and that is collaboration between institutions. Uh, uh, and if you look at the next slide, we can see that we built Health Data Research UK as a collaborative distributed institute. And the MRC did the same on the next slide with the Dementia, UK Dementia Research Institute. And indeed from the outset with that on the next slide, you can see that we involved industry uh, in something we call Dementia's Platform UK. So if we go to uh, the next slide, and I'm nearly finished now, um, here's the Coxie Continuum. Two differences between those two gaps, I tend to think. The first gap, if you traverse that, you can make money. The second gap, if you traverse that, you can save money, both of which are beneficial for the economy. So making money, if we look at um, a collaboration on the next slide, uh, involves discovery and commercialization and the MRC partnered AstraZeneca to set up a centre for lead discovery. A similar thing in Melbourne is, is all public funded in uh, the WeHi. Uh, if we go to the next slide uh, and think about the second gap, then the NIHR set up, if we go to the next slide please, a different sort of partnership in this case with healthcare organisations. Now, uh, the days of collaborations for leadership and applied health research and care have been simplified because they're now just called ARCs. But if you look at the next slide, you can see that the ethos that these things were set up under was really about how to implement um, uh, solutions to problems that arise in the health service. Uh, uh, and you can see that there are uh, disciplines involved in generating the question, structuring the question, answering it, implementing the answer and evaluating the implementation. And to finish very quickly, that of course is where NHMRC uh, on the next slide wanted the Advanced Health Research Translation Centres to focus uh, uh, and MAC, the organisation I serve, is one of seven you can see it's got 10 health service partners, eight medical research institutes, University of Melbourne with um, La Trobe University, an affiliate partner, uh, massive investment in healthcare research and education, massive impact on the population. And our purpose on the next slide is to bring together health services, health scientists and health care consumers to translate interdisciplinary research in, into improved healthcare and a stronger economy. Now I won't waste time on the next slide which is our strategy, you can see that um, uh, if you go to the slide uh, to the website of MAC. Uh, but what I want to finish with uh, is this concept of two nations divided by a common language. So if we go to the next slide, um, uh, if we can press on please, sorry, thank you. Uh, in Australia, public health service means an organisation delivering healthcare. In Britain, public health service means an organisation that delivers healthcare and which provides an underpinning research workforce. And if we go to the next slide, in Australia, public health research funding means funding to support research projects. In Britain, public health research funding means support for projects and for a research workforce embedded in healthcare. Uh, and I think that the project that Chris is leading would benefit by perhaps uh, addressing these differences in understanding that we have about what the health service is and what health research funding are. Because I think that the differences that have developed in Britain over the last 15 years have absolutely transformed Britain's ability to do translational 
clinical research to improve healthcare uh, and to stimulate the economy. So I'll finish by thanking the 19 full partners on the next slide of MAC, who uh, provided me with the opportunity to move to Australia a couple of years ago and stop there, Chris. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, John, for a wonderful talk. Um, we already have questions from the audience and I might uh, read out the first one from Frank Gannon. What are the structural problems that you see exist in Australia that could act as barriers to doing what you have described in the UK? I, I, I think the, the structural problem uh, is that the, the money isn't all in the right place. And what I've been arguing is that some of the money to support the ecosystem for health and medical research should be uh, uh, available within healthcare uh, in the front line. Thank you. Um, just a follow up question. It seemed easier to me from what you presented, it's easier to follow the money in the UK system than it is in the Australian system. Is that inherent in the UK system, it's, it's more clearly defined? Why do you think that is? So in fact, in fact, finding the money was what created the NIHR in 2006. And the process of finding the money started a decade before, because in Britain, huge amounts of money were in the NHS earmarked for research, but in fact, were not supporting research and translation. And it wasn't really until Sally Davies took this over in England that she literally tore this money out of the grasp of chief executives, some of whom have never forgiven her, even though it was a tiny proportion of the money that they used for patient care, uh, and dedicated this to research and translation. So the reason I had all those question marks is that maybe in Australia, there's a big budget there that uh, could be found and redirected to supporting research and translation in the front line. Maybe yes. not. I don't know. Well, maybe we're, we're going to need to look for it. Um, there's lots of questions coming in. There's uh, two questions on um, clinical training pathways. The first one is clinician research and researcher pathways are more complex to achieve in general practice and primary care. How can these be delivered outside hospital settings? So yeah, so um, we've been able to do that in the MAC track in that one of our first um, recruits is a general practitioner. And the reason we're able to do that was that the employer um, at the time was the university because the individual had won a part-time RACGP fellowship with the university department, which was a very key part of MAC, uh, and therefore was able to be given the flexibility to do pre-PhD work. Um, it would be very difficult um, uh, to get that um, salaried if one is a conventional GP who's not in a, a, an organization that's prepared to pay you while you do on average a day a week of pre-PhD preparation. And a related question on clinician researcher pathways, how can these be developed for allied health as well as for medical practitioners? Very good question. And we uh, have found ways to expand this scheme uh, initially to nurses, midwives and allied health professionals with, uh, from advertisement next year. Uh, and the key thing was to discover how to deliver professional equity. And that meant that the young medics, as well as training and research, are training in a specialism and becoming more specialist doctors. Uh, and what the road to Damascus experience for me was that physios can be trained to be specialist physios. Nurses can be trained to be clinical nurse consultants and nurse practitioners. Uh, midwives can be trained to be um, clinical midwifery practitioners. So it's bringing the two things together makes this feasible. And another follow-up question on the same topic. 
uh, from Phil O'Connell. I like your model for training clinician scientists. Have you talked to the colleges about this? Training is overly long at present. Yeah, I, I, um, I was never very popular in the UK because I always said that training had too long for too long. Um, uh, and we supposedly moved to competency-based uh, training. I would say that Australian training doesn't seem to me to be too long. It seems to me to be about right. Uh, the colleges that we approached were nearly all of them, and by and large, they're really supportive. And most of them, uh, some of them, in fact, the obstruction doesn't come from colleges. It actually comes from the clinicians who lead that little bit of service that's going to have to give up point to FTE of sure. uh, their registrar. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, from John Zaltzberg. Uh, great talk, John. Could you clarify how the NHS benefits by 28,000 P for every yeah. participant entered into commercial studies, please? Yeah, you can find that on their website. They did a, um, uh, I think it was KPMG did an analysis for them on the 2017-18 data. And it comprises two things. The first is the fee that you get into the NHS for doing the trial, but it's also the savings on medicines. And there, there is a difference here because in the UK, um, the trial would also fund the standard of care medicines as well as the trial medicines. So there's a saving on medicines too. Thank you. Uh, from John Caldor, great talk. Can you please comment on how our federal system may help or hinder such endeavors? Uh, I, I, I think um, uh, I operated in a system in Britain not dissimilar because I worked 21 years in Scotland, devolved very like a state with its own health budgets. Uh, and in fact, canny academics can play the two things off against each other. So you can be saying to the state, well, we've got money from federal to do this. Why aren't you doing this and vice versa? And we used to do this all the time in Scotland versus UK. I think the, the most difficult thing that Australia has to face is this divide between primary care being funded by the, the federal government, the Commonwealth government, and hospitals largely being funded by the state. And that is a big structural problem. Sure. I've got a slightly controversial question. Um, despite wonderful evidence that you've shown us today of research being embedded in the healthcare system. One could argue that Australia maybe performed better in terms of COVID management, at least from a public health response than the UK. Would you like to comment on that maybe controversial yeah, I'd, I'd love to comment on that. I think that's because um, uh, one of the weakest subjects in in Britain in um, research has been public health. And we've been worried about that for an awful long time. Uh, sure. uh, and, I, and there wasn't an organized system to do the brilliant things that Australia did in, um, in terms of uh, uh, prevention of spread. But the converse is that I uh, don't think Australia has played a particularly good game in vaccination. Whereas, of course, Britain um, had a research led vaccination response, which turned out much better. So um, it's the ashes soon. We can lob bombs at each other over cricket instead of COVID. Uh, but well done to Australia for a brilliant public health response and well done to another new fellow, Jodie McVernon, who together with James McCaw did so much of the work that the Commonwealth Government used to protect us all. Thank you so much, John. That's a, a good time to end. That was a wonderful talk. And I'd like to thank all the questioners. Uh, we got a great question session going and it was a really informative and enjoyable session. So thank you so much. And I'm gonna now hand back to Kieran. 
Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much indeed, John. That was an extraordinarily interesting session, interesting perspective, interesting comparison between the UK and Australia.